Hello, can you all hear me? Yep. Nice. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming to the to, to my talk. Um, this is my first talk, but very excited. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, making puzzles for people who don't like puzzle games, or the less spicy title, designing puzzles for cross-genre games. Um, so this is either designing puzzles for games that uh, to appeal to a broad audience, or designing puzzles to go in a game. Actually, yeah, I should hold the mic at the right distance. Or designing puzzles for uh, games that aren't necessarily puzzle games, like maybe designing a puzzle to go in an action game or something. So, um, who am I? Uh, I'm Matt. Um, you might follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm a game developer. Uh, I'm a game designer. I do yeah, design, code, sometimes art. Uh, and if you've heard me, it's probably because I am the director and designer behind uh, Viewfinder, which I'll talk about a bit more later. Um, so I, I make puzzle games. Um, these are a bunch of like prototypey games I've made. Some of them are just uh, terrible. Uh, this one here is like a Rubik's cube, but you can also like slide the pieces. Uh, this one here is like lights out, but on the surface of complex shapes. I love puzzle games. Uh, sometimes somewhat obscure or bad ones. Um, I also like doing experimental games, so um, these are some copies of Game Jam games. So for example, this one here is a game that's kind of based off quantum physics, where you have objects where when you interact with them, the timeline splits in two, and that can happen repeatedly, so you end up with timeline getting more and more fractured, you get these tiny little windows. Uh, I also do graphics, I do shaders. Um, uh, these are some random effects I've done. This one's uh, okay, the projection view. This one's some glitchy effect I did a while ago. On a black hole. Um, if I use that in anything. Um, yeah, so uh, I do a bunch of stuff related to game design and graphics. Um, but like I said, if you've heard me, it's probably because of Viewfinder. So uh, you might have seen Viewfinder. In fact, has anyone played the demo of Viewfinder? It was out for about a week, a few weeks ago. Yes, we have some people who played the demo. Thank you for checking out the demo. Um, it's going to be coming out sometime this year. Um, the main mechanic, uh, so it's a game about pictures and photography. It's kind of a puzzly game. So uh, the main mechanic is uh, you can take a picture of something, and once you've taken a picture of it, uh, it behaves like the real thing. Like um, So you kind of change your environment, and you mess with the world, and... And you also have uh, pips in a bunch of different visual styles, so you might find a painting or a crayon drawing or something like that, and you can step into these pips and explore them, and it's kind of about exploring these different visual styles and stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's also, um, uh, yeah, so as I said, it's, it's coming out later this year. It's kind of exciting. We've already won a Game of the Year award, which is very exciting, um, and uh, we've shown it at some events. Um, yeah, so why is Viewfinder a puzzle game? Because it doesn't necessarily need to be, because the thing that's like the defining feature of Viewfinder is this picture mechanic, which isn't, you know, by definition a puzzle mechanic, it's just a mechanic. Um, but the gameplay of the game is, is puzzle gameplay, and the reason for that is that it feels, the, the mechanic kind of lends itself well to puzzle gameplay. It's quite difficult to get your head around it, so you kind of need the game to feel a bit like a tutorial for the mechanic and showing you ways that you can use it and present you with interesting situations where the mechanic can help you. Yeah, so it lends itself well to uh, puzzle gameplay. So for example, even a really simple challenge like this. So we've got the player uh, standing here, and they want to get to this thing here. And in this case, it's like a teleporter, but they, yeah, they need to get across to there. Now, even a really simple puzzle like that, um, or even a simple obstacle like that, makes for an interesting puzzle, because then there's two different solutions to that. One is that you take some of the platform near you, and you copy it, and you put it here, so you make a little grid for yourself. Uh, another is that you kind of think outside the box of it, and instead of trying to get to the goal, you bring the goal closer to you, you take a picture of it, and you put the picture here so you can walk around to get there. So it lends itself really nicely to puzzle gameplay, so it made a lot of sense to do that. So, um, so why is this a problem? Um, puzzle, some people don't like puzzle games. Um, puzzle ga puzzle uh, is a genre like any other, it has its own dedicated audience, which is not all gamers, a lot of people uh, aren't into puzzle games. So for example, I've got this uh, tweet here. Um, I was very flattering. The technical skill on display with this mechanic is amazing. Thank you. I'm not normally big on puzzle games, but I would play this. So that's, a, so that's a sentiment I've heard from a lot of people. They'll see it and they're like, this looks really cool. I want to play with this. I don't care about puzzles. I'm not interested in puzzles. I want to play this though. Uh, so we had to kind of like 
uh, walked the tightrope of making a game that was an interesting, good puzzle game, but would appeal to a broad audience. Um, so one way to look at it is that Viewfinder is a cross-genre game. Uh, there's a lot of games that you could consider to be cross-genre, um, and so in the case of Viewfinder, it's kind of blending the genres of puzzle, uh, optical illusion, it's a small genre and usually overlaps with puzzle, but I think it is a genre of its own. Um, sandbox, adventure. So we might get people who would play an adventure game, but wouldn't necessarily usually play a puzzle game coming to it, and you know, we want to think about what their experience is going to be like. So uh, when you're making cross-genre games and blended for genres, it's important to think what you're bringing from each of those genres. So, uh, for example, Grand Theft Auto, you might consider it to be a, a cross-genre game of a shooter and a driving game. And it brings in elements of both shooters and driving games. But it streamlines both the shooting and driving elements. Um, so that, uh, for example, like um, a, a really hardcore driving game might simulate uh, tire wear on your car. Whereas GTA V kind of uh, streamlines it a bit, makes it a bit more straightforward. You don't have to change gears and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, yes, yeah, so the goal is to uh, appeal to fans of either genre, rather than only appealing to the niche that is fans of both genres. Um, so how do we do this with puzzle games? How do we take uh, the puzzle genre and take elements of it that work well for, uh, for a broader audience and make a game that can be enjoyed by people who wouldn't usually be into niche esoteric puzzle games? Um, so this is just a bunch of my opinions on this. I mean, I, uh, this is my first professional game that I've worked on, game that I've worked on professionally. Um, this is some stuff that I've kind of found through the process of developing it and testing it and seeing what works well and what doesn't. But different required games are going to require different approaches. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, some of these can also just generally apply to puzzle games uh, in general. Like, doesn't need to be ones that apply to a broad audience. Um, yeah, uh, and I've made a list of a bunch of them. So, okay, first one, just first rule of thumb, uh, look at references. Uh, look at games that do uh, similar things to what you want to do. Look at games that appeal to the same kinds of players that you might want to appeal to. Um, in, uh, in our case, I looked at uh, games like uh, Portal or uh, The Witness, uh, Monument Valley. Um, and, and you can look at both, if for, for this, particular case, you can look at both uh, puzzle games that are kind of pure puzzle games that appeal to a broad audience, or you can look at non-puzzle games that have puzzle elements. So like, I think I'd say that, like, uh, you can't really see it, this is a picture of Inside. If you play that, it's, <laughs> yeah, you really can't see it's with pitch black. Um, Inside is great, it's, um, uh, and I think that if, it, it's, the core gameplay is puzzle, but I think that if you ask someone, they wouldn't necessarily immediately jump to that. They might say it's more about, um, atmospheric or narrative or that kind of stuff. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of games that do this really well, that like really manage to be puzzle games that are good puzzles in their own right, but also appeal to people who wouldn't usually pick up a puzzle game. Portal's like the perfect example. Like, um, loads of people like Portal and a lot of people play it who wouldn't play like more niche puzzle games. Um, so, uh, Rule number two, um, visually intuitive mechanics. So one thing that you can quite often uh, find with uh, puzzle games, or like pure puzzle games, is the mechanics will feel a bit arbitrary. Uh, so this, uh, if any of you played Undertale, this is a bit where it's kind of mocking games that do that uh, by having this grid here that the player needs to walk across, and each of these tiles is a different color, and it gives you a list of what every single type of tile does and what the different colors mean. And it's you know completely incomprehensible. Like you look at this, you can't, you know, it's 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 not good. And that's uh, that's that's the joke. Um, yeah. So as a counterexample, um, uh, let's take the toxic sludge in Portal. It's at the bottom of that test chamber there. So that is a puzzle mechanic. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily think that because it just feels intuitive. It's just part of the design of that space. Um, but it's absolutely a puzzle mechanic, like it's uh, setting some constraints for what you can do in that space. And uh, it's intuitive for several reasons. One is like you know that you don't want to touch it, uh, it looks gross and you don't want to fall in it. Um, and the other is uh, you know how gravity works. You know that if you're in any of these spaces around here, then gravity will pull you towards it. So it is a puzzle mechanic, but it's using things that are very intuitive to the player, and so it doesn't, it barely needs an explanation. Um, 
the pitfall of this approach is that uh, you can get games doing similar things to each other. I don't know how well these ones are showing up. So, uh, for example, a lot of games that aren't puzzle games, if they have a puzzle element, it might include, for example, uh, pushing crates. So many games include pushing crates in puzzles. And, I mean, there's good reasons for this. So one is it's incredibly intuitive. Everyone knows how you push a crate. And also it's quite versatile. You know, it, like, crates can block entrances or they can block each other or, like, yeah. But it is kind of a cliche and it's what you might want to avoid because it feels very puzzly. Um, so, a counterexample within Viewfinder, um, uh, one of my mechanics, this is a suggestion from my colleague Gwen, it's a great suggestion, is there's a photocopier. And uh, this integrates nicely with the picture mechanic, because if you have a picture, you can put it in the photocopier, it does what you expect a photocopier to do, it produces a copy of the picture, and it comes out all like grainy looking, it's like a really like low quality photocopier, it's great. Um, and this is good, because it, it's a puzzle mechanic that really doesn't need an explanation, it works exactly how you would expect it to do because people know how photocopiers work. Um, and so there's a few cases in the game where we've tried to do that with, um, uh, there's a few cases in the game where we've tried to do that uh, with having mechanics that kind of work like you'd accept back to. I mean, the main mechanic itself is, is an instant camera, and people know what an instant camera does. You take a picture, and it prints out that picture. Okay, uh, next uh, uh, rule. Uh, think about what stories your puzzles tell. The stories have universal appeal. Um, everyone likes stories. Um, and when I talk about stories, I don't mean in terms of narrative that's told through dialogue or, uh, I don't know, notes or anything like that. I mean uh, the story that's what the player would tell you if you asked them to describe how they solved a puzzle. So this would be things like, I thought this, I saw that, um, this thing didn't do what I expected. Um, so as a counterexample, um, this this is a puzzle, you might have played one of these. Uh, the puzzle is that you slide these blocks around to try and get them back to their starting positions. And it's a good puzzle, but it doesn't really tell any story. If you ask the player to describe how they solved a puzzle, it's say I moved six up and I moved four across the way or whatever. Um, so yeah, so it's good to think about what puzzles, what stories your puzzle design tells. So um, yeah, it's especially good if uh, it's a story that involves the player's emotions. So like a puzzle could make the player surprised, it could make the player confused, uh, it could be satisfying, it could make them feel proud of what they've done. Um, so as an example from a puzzle within Viewfinder, so uh, this is a puzzle roughly near the start of the game where the players still get into grips with the mechanics. So I've broken down to these three steps. So what first happens is you find a picture of a bridge, and you use it to bridge a gap. You use it to get from here over to here. And it's really satisfying and neat, because it fits in perfectly. It's just the right length. It's, um, and it's kind of a satisfying illusion as you kind of move around, and you see it, it's 3D. Hmm. Um, but later in the level, you've come to this, um, this goal up here, which is up on top of a platform. Um, but the picture that you find isn't really what you need for that. You find this picture, which is the side of a building, and so you kind of you know, it's a, you've hit a roadblock, it's uh, confusing. It's like, why have I been given this? Um, and then the solution is you realize, ah, I can repurpose it. I can turn it on its side to make a ramp. And so it's kind of a little story of the player first using something for its intended purpose and then needing to kind of think outside the box of it and repurpose something to use for something different. Uh, and then the final bit, you kind of walk up the side of the building, which is pretty cool. Hmm. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so the next uh, rule, um, break up puzzle gameplay. This is a pretty common thing that puzzle games that are trying to appeal to a broader audience will do. So maybe they'll have sections that are walking simulator, maybe they'll have sections that are more action, or platforming, or exploring, or narrative. And it can just make it so the player doesn't feel like uh, they're just fatigued and tired of puzzles. Um, additionally, like if you have a long section with a lot of puzzles in a row, this can be kind of can get people fatigued if they're not really into that. Um, especially this, this often can happen in the games where they'll have like a mechanic that has a huge amount of depth and that's really cool, but if you kind of put that all in a row, then players are going to just get tired of that. Um, nothing, uh, yeah, minimize like the perceived complexity. So uh, this is, I mean this is a good rule of general for puzzles, but especially if you're trying to uh, onboard people who wouldn't usually be interested in puzzle games or would be turned off by puzzle games. If they look at a puzzle and they can see, oh, there's only three elements and I know how all of them work, they are more likely to start engaging with it than if there were like 20 elements. At that point, they're just going to be like, done. 
Um, so uh, we've got a couple examples here from uh, Viewfinder. So for example, this, this is a relatively difficult puzzle, but it only really has three elements a player needs to know, and they're all things that the player's already encountered before. We've got this camera here, we've got a battery here, and we've got the goal here. So like, it means that it's not kind of intimidating when a player starts a level. And so it means you kind of, um, you kind of get them in the door, and at that point they're thinking about it, and, maybe, and it looks easier than it should be, and then, uh, and then they're thinking about it, and that's what you want. Uh, next one. Oh yeah, difficulty is okay. Just because you're making a puzzle for a non-puzzle audience, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be uh, that it has to be easy. Um, and in fact, if you make if you just make it easier, then if uh, people who are more into puzzle games play it, then it's just going to feel easier. It's not going to be fun. Um, so ideally, what you want is if you have a difficult puzzle, is you want the player to be kicking themselves when they figure it out. Like a really difficult puzzle should have a correspondingly elegant solution. When you find the solution, you shouldn't feel like uh, you were tricked or like you were misled or you weren't given the information you needed. If you have a difficult puzzle, it should feel like the solution is really smart when you get it. Um, so it, you should be thinking about where difficulty is coming from in your puzzle. Is it coming from it being convoluted? Is it coming from the rules being unclear? Is it coming from the execution being difficult? Maybe it requires perfect timing or whatever. Um, and difficulty shouldn't really be coming from those things. It should be coming from other places. <laughs> uh, yeah, seventh one is, uh, you can't please everyone. Um, this is just a general thing with puzzle games. Uh, everyone is going to get stuck, stuck somewhere. Even if someone's really good at and really experienced puzzle games, there are going to be some puzzles where they get to them, and it could be a really simple puzzle, it, and it's just not going to click for them. Um, and this is, yeah, this, this applies more generally to puzzle games, but especially if you're making puzzle games that you want to be enjoyed by a non-puzzle game audience. Um, and so sometimes you can, like, uh, make individual puzzles less uh, bad for this. You can clear up common misconceptions or ambiguities. Um, hints is a good way to help with that, because if you've really stuck on something, then you can get a hint that can help you move on. Um, and one thing that puzzle games, uh, puzzle games specifically, like, um, uh, you know, niche puzzle game, puzzle games within the puzzle game genre, is they'll often uh, use optional content. Increasingly, I think, because in the past I think this was less common, but now most puzzle games will be branchy in one way or another because puzzles do inherently have this aspect that some people are just going to get stuck on one of them. Uh, and so letting the player walk away from a puzzle and go on to do other stuff uh, can be really good. Um, <coughs> Playtest and iterate. Uh, Playtesting is so important for puzzle games because so much of it is about what the player knows and what they assume about the gameplay. Um, oh, I've run over a little bit, I need to finish off quickly. Um, so, yeah, watch people play. It's really useful to see exactly how people approach things and what they think. Um, and make changes based off the play test, then repeat the process. Um, to sum up, uh, looking at references is really important. Um, play testing is really important. And a lot of stuff is going to end up on the cutting room floor. Stuff is going it, to... It's worth trying stuff and then cutting it, just because sometimes things aren't going to... Be what you're aiming for. Got an example here. Early on in Viewfinder, there were these like stars that you had to collect, and like people enjoyed the gameplay, but it felt very gamey and a bit more puzzly, and it wasn't really kind of what we were aiming for. Um, I, we have a couple minutes Q and A. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um,